I am J.R. Richardson with Integrated Solutions. We're a uh, boutique premier service provider uh, for businesses, voice and data services, MPLS networks. So most of my customer base is on net to me uh, because I provide the service 100% out to the customer. Okay, so voice networks connected to the internet, uh, the public internet, I should say, it are constant targets for scanners, people wanting to make free phone calls in your system, through your system. So it's, uh, I used to take it kind of personally. If you've ever been hacked, it feels kind of like your first night in prison. You feel extremely violated, but uh, it's not personal. It's just uh, machines out there, botnets, they're gonna scan you, they're gonna try to make phone calls to your system. What we're gonna talk about today is using fail to ban which is a log scanner and we're going to read those logs and uh, we're going to automatically when a specific log message comes in that you had a hack attempt we're going to automatically uh, generate uh, access list on your gateways to uh, block those attackers so here's a common voip attack uh, hopefully you can see this this was a honeypot pbx i put on the network a public ip address uh, went online uh, June 21st at 5.14 in the, in the afternoon. What you're seeing here is registration attempts. Started three hours and 13 minutes after this machine went, on the, went online. And what you see here real, uh, is they're scanning extension 101 and all the way down through um, 9999. So a scan from one, extension 100 through 9999 completed in 120 seconds, two minutes, okay? That's a lot of uh, traffic hitting your network, hitting your PBX, okay? So uh, I had some just generic extensions on there that uh, gave a response that, hey, extension 605 is here. Once the initial scan happens to identify what extensions are on the system, then the scan starts to do a password attack on valid extensions. So in the initial message, you see no matching peer found, but when it hits one, you'll see a different message that says wrong password. The password, which I had set at one, two, three, four, was cracked in 35 seconds. And then, uh, so this machine was successfully hacked in three hours, 15 minutes, and 35 seconds from going live, okay? That, uh, that's pretty quick. But uh, well, one thing I wanted you to notice is the actual IP address that the, phone, that the phone calls were attempted from is not the same as the scan. So you have scanners from different parts of the internet are gonna, uh, in, uh, they're gonna gain access to your system or get the authentication access into your system, they're gonna ship that off to someplace else that's actually gonna make the phone calls. And of course, being a honeypot, I just played back TT monkeys, so when they routed phone calls to, you just heard a bunch of screaming monkeys. I'm sure they, lo they loved it. So this is a registration attack. Uh, so as complex as you can make your usernames in your sip.conf, uh, they usually, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty slick. They, they do all kinds of, you know, two, 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 and two kids. Look, here's one that says 57 Chevy. So even though you're using common names or stuff, they, they have all these. Uh, this was just a blurb of about uh, 100,000 registration attempts uh, for a uh, uh, registration attack. Okay, so who in here believes or is the mindset that the PBX should also be your security mechanism? Show of hands, nobody believes that? We got a couple, okay. So a small system, it's, uh, you, you, can, you can run the, the PBX uh, application and also a security application on there. Now, who's of the mindset that security should be handled off the PBX? I, I agree with that. Uh, I think uh, you know, security should be done on a security box that's specially built to handle the load for security. Fail to ban. Uh, is going to scan logs, so it's just a log scanner. Who does not know or, or not familiar with fail to ban? Okay, so this is a great project. It's been around a long time. It's not VoIP specific. It's pretty agnostic. You can also use it to block uh, uh, WWW attacks and uh, all, all kind of SSH attacks. 
So it's not specifically used for VoIP. The project's been around a long time. It's very mature, uh, works great. You have to use strong passwords. One, two, three, four does not cut it. But that was just an uh, example. Okay, so in uh, asterisk specific, uh, so in the general section, uh, you always want to put a context. This is in the general section, that's where anybody can access your system, right? So uh, a bogus context is in, if they do successfully gain access to your system through the general context, you don't want them routable to your internal dial plan or your external or outbound dial plan. You just uh, you, you stick them in just a, a, a place that goes nowhere. Allow guest is no. That means that you have to have a valid peer in the SIP.conf uh, SIP to gain access through the SIP channel. And this also applies to the other SIP channels as well. I mean, uh, the other asterisk channels being H323, the skinny channel, uh, IEX, the same thing applies. In the actual user context, so in that extension 605 or extension 1001, you want to use uh, the deny and the permit statements for, you know, it, it's just basically a little access list that you're doing there. And what this does is when you get an attack, you're going to get a very specific message in the log that says uh, ACL uh, uh, denied or uh, ACL error. And we want to use those messages. We want to match on those messages. So it's important to do that. Uh, another thing is when you're permitting your networks, these are my networks, okay? I'm permitting specifically only my networks. I'm not permitting the entire internet to access the box and the machine. And of course, the VoIPinfo.org has some great uh, things about security. Uh, I encourage you to take a look. So a Cisco access list, uh, it, it's, a, it's a mechanism common in Cisco routers, switches, ac access lists have been around a long time. So it's security, you're using security mechanisms to uh, block access to the network that you're trying to protect. So real basically on a, one of my VoIP access lists, I specifically permit in the front. So an, also an access list is read from the top down, all right? So uh, it, it reads and as soon as it gets a match, it sends the packet on through. So I specifically permit networks that I never ever want to be blocked. So who would be 4.55? Who knows who that network is? That's level three, okay. Uh, upstream, this is just an example. Upstream uh, SIP provider, right? You don't want an attack happening and then automatically block that network. And you wanna be very, very specific in the networks that you do allow. Uh, the subnets, uh, the, the, you, know, you don't wanna lock it down. And then of course, I have uh, the scripts that I use block between 101 and 300. That's a rotating uh, number. You'll see that in the scripts where when I apply a access list, uh, when I get to count 300, uh, the script will revert that number back to 100 and I'll start at the bottom again and work my way up. And then after that, you can specifically, what, what I do in my access list, I like to see what countries I'm getting a lot of uh, attempts from. So I'll do the class A's and block those. And then of course at the bottom, you have your implicit uh, deny all. So here's general architecture. Uh, so you have hosted PBX systems as an ISP. This is, a, this is a typical ISP model. You have your internet, you have your gateways to your internet, your, your local switching network, uh, your users, your valid users out there on the internet, and you have, of course have hackers. Well, what I'm implementing here is a uh, central logging server. So all this guy does is collect all the logs from the PBXs. Uh, he's running Apache CGI for some interaction uh, in, the, in the emails that I get. And Fail to ban, of course, is running on it, and our syslog is the, uh, the, the syslog daemon I use to um, capture all the log files. So uh, just the, the hacker flow, hacker attempts access to hosted PBX through attacks, different types of uh, attacks. The PBX is configured specifically to send log messages to the central repository, the central uh, syslog server. Uh, when a trigger occurs, uh, fail to ban, of course, is running on that box. It's scanning uh, the logs every second, and it's going to call the scripts. When it gets a trigger, it's going to call the scripts that are going to log into the Cisco devices and actually implement the access list. So just running through visually, pictorially, we're going to look at how that happens. Network's up and running. A hacker, he decides to attack this PBX. Uh, the logs are shipped off to the central repository server. 
and they in turn uh, throw up the access list at the gate and the hacker is thwarted. He must go someplace else. Okay, so now we're gonna get into kind of the meat of it. There's a lot of information here, but uh, just as a side note, I put the presentation up, it'll be on the website. I also wrote a Word document that has all the complete scripts. So you can get the Word document off the website and cut and paste and, and these, uh, these scripts will pretty much work out of the box. Uh, the Linux, Linux based server, right? So it's, all it's doing is sitting there collecting log messages and fail to bands running. It's a very low usage, low, uh, low process, low, low resource. It, it's just gonna sit there and run. There's not a lot, there's not a lot going on there. Uh, so you don't need a uh, Dell R710 or uh, a compact, uh, one of the big servers. This is, you know, it could be on an old Pentium white box special or something like that that you, that, that you repurpose. Uh, MySQL data, well, of course, fail to ban uh, is the log scanner. There's the website, fail to ban.org. Been around a long time, great community. Uh, open source project, of course. MySQL, I use a MySQL database. You don't need it, it's not necessary, but I also do other logging functions and I put all my logs into a database and use the Adiscon log analyzer. It gives you the web front end so you can go in there and do detailed searches in the logs and just find all the good stuff. And of course I use on the server, I'm running Apache with CGI because I'm interacting with the server when I get the notification emails, I can do stuff. Uh, PHP module, if you're you, you need PHP and the PHP module for MySQL if you're gonna use the log analyzer. Okay, so here's the R syslog server. It, it's R syslog out of the box is Debian distribution. Uh, it, it's the main syslog engine for Debian. If you don't have it on your system, it's probably just a package download or you can install it directly. You can go to rsyslog.org, I think. Uh, and so what you wanna do out of the box, it does not listen for uh, log messages coming to it. It just, it just acts as the local host log logging uh, engine. So you have to mod load IMUDP, which turns on the service to receive log messages. And of course you tell it to, uh, you, you wanna use port 514, or you can change the port, 514 is the default syslog port. So asterisk by nature is a pretty chatty, uh, you get a, lot of, um, get a lot of logs, okay? So you don't want to get all the logs. You, you, want, you want fail to ban to be scanning the smallest log possible. So if you have phones on the internet and uh, it's, it, it's a bad connection, what happens to the phones? They drop off registration, they come back. So you get a lot of these uh, kind of noise logs where they're just not needed. So you can, in, in our syslog has a mechanism to discard these messages so they don't fill up your logs. So fail to ban doesn't have to read through them and, and try to match. So you, you, can, you can put these discards in there to keep your logs as small as possible. So by default, it's in at uh, var log syslog. Uh, the messages will go. Uh, you can actually specify local zero, which is the asterisk, well, we're, we're, uh, which we're specified in asterisk. We're gonna use the local zero tag for the syslogs. And you can actually send those logs to be scanned in, an, in, a, in another log file wherever you like. So our syslog also has an embedded SNMTP engine emailing. So we're gonna load that module, it's called OnMail. And you set up the, you know, the domain and where you're gonna send the logs to, uh, or the emails, you're gonna send them to your sysadmin, whatever. And then you're also gonna specify if the message contains wrong password, then you're gonna call OnMail and send the message. Uh, if it contains forbidden, if it contains ACL permit deny, uh, if it, there's a syntax error. So you can specify what messages you receive as the sysadmin. And of course, once you make the configuration, it's a typical Linux daemon, you have to restart it. So here's the PBX setup. This is a typical message you're gonna see in your logs. So a uh, SIP channel, registration from blah, 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 failed for blah, blah, ACL permit deny error, okay? So we wanna get these messages from asterisk to the central syslog engine, right? So asterisk doesn't natively have a mechanism to send the logs, its logs 
off the box. So what, but it does have a mechanism to go ahead and do syslog local. So asterisk will send its message log to the local syslog engine on the PBX. And in the syslog configuration of the local PBX, it natively has a mechanism to transmit those logs off-site. So this would be the IP address of the R syslog server. So once again, asterisk sends its log to the local syslog server, and then the syslog engine on the box just natively transfers those logs out to your central repository. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about fail to ban. It, it's got several config files. We'll step through them. Uh, the first, uh, of course, uh, when you do the uh, fail to ban install, it's, a, it's mostly a package for damn near every distribution. You just use your package manager to install it, or you can install the latest source code from the website. So its configuration files are in Etsy fail to ban jails.conf. So this is, th this is an important section for us. So in jails.conf, it defines all your jails, so you could have multiple jails. I just have one jail here uh, as an example. So, but in the default section, you have a switch called ignore IP. This is pretty important. Uh, notice I have the, the private IP addresses. If you're, if you're getting registrations from your local LAN and uh, a phone went out and it had a bad password or something, it's a legitimate, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a false positive, right? So it, it'll generate a hacker attempt and fail to ban is gonna act upon that unless you ignore those IPs. And of course, as a service provider, I ignore my IPs from my customers because I control all that network anyway. So I make sure that uh, one of my phones doesn't go out with a bad password. If it does, it's okay. I'll get the error message and I'll go fix the problem. But because it, was a, it looked like a hacker attempt, fail to ban is not gonna act upon it and it's not gonna shut down that network for all the other 200 phones on that local network. So this is a pretty important uh, guy right here. Okay, so asterisk is just, it's, it's just a name, right? It could, it could say you could be SSH or anything. It's just an arbitrary name. We're gonna enable it. The filter is gonna be called asterisk, which is another file that we're gonna look at. The action, when we get a hit on the filter, we're gonna do something. So this guy is gonna send us, fail to ban actually sends an email and lets me know when fail to ban acts and says, hey, I just blocked somebody. And we'll look at those emails. Uh, max try, I think it defaults to three or six or something like that. You have one attempt to uh, access my network. And if that generates a log, I'm going to block you in one attempt. I'm not going to wait three times or 10 times just to see if you're really serious about hacking my network. You got one attempt, and we're going to block you. Uh, and then you have some timeout mechanisms for uh, about five minutes to, to uh, replenish. Okay, so here's the filter. This is what we're gonna filter on. Um, it, this is Linux-based regular expression type syntax. It's a little arcane uh, if you're not very familiar with it, but basically we're gonna match on the message. This is the whole message, okay? So you have to have your spaces in the right place, your colons in the right place, uh, what, do, what are your, your, your matching on? Uh, device does not match ACL, ACL error, then you have a couple of switches in there. Now, the good thing about this, it's, on, it's already on, on the security website, not only here, but there's more. There's more stuff that you want to match on. This is just example. So you, can, you don't have to write this yourself. A lot of people have already implemented this, and uh, it's out there on the web. You can cut and paste and, and uh, do these matches. Okay. So when a log entry is matched and failed to ban, we're going to call uh, this file the, in, in the action.d directory. It's called ACL, which we called in, our, uh, uh, in the other configuration file. We're going to act on it. What are we going to do? The action ban to ban it. Now, you can also have an action to unban, so you can dynamically add and take out uh, ACLs as needed. So this guy is going to call. All we're, all we're doing here is we're going to specify the ACL execute dot per, it's, it's a Perl script, and we're gonna also add the variable IP. So uh, the IP is getting from the host. So in the, in the registration failed attempt, you have this, uh, this variable host that is going to go into the IP parameter when we call the script. 
All right, stepping right through. We're, now we're going to look at the actual Perl script that does the work. It, it, it's going to apply the ACL. So it's in the action.d directory. It's just it's an executable uh, script. Uh, it's written in Perl. You have your typical Perl handles up here. What we're also going to include in our Perl libraries is Telnet Cisco. So we're going to be Telnetting directly into Cisco routers with this script. And we're also going to include SNMP. TP, SMTP, because, hey, I like emails. I like getting a lot of emails. So this script is going to send me an email as well. So I've got some triple validation when I get a hacker attempt. I've got our syslog sending me an email. I've got fail to ban sending me an email. And I've got these scripts sending me emails as well. So it just validates what's going on. Uh, you set some parameters. Uh, I'm not going to get re de really detailed here. Uh, you know, Perl is, is, is a great language, it's simple, there's a ton of documentation about how to set these up, set up variables. If you're not familiar with uh, Perl, I suggest you read some of the Perl websites, uh, beginning uh, uh, websites, and you can get up to speed really, really quick. If I can do it, most people can. So a couple of not notable things here in the script, and this is the, the complete script, by the way. Uh, open count, I do a count file. This is, this is that mechanism where I counted the, my ACL number, my ACL number in the Cisco router. It's going to start at 100 to 300. So when the script count or the ACL count gets greater than 300, I just put it back to 100. Very simple mechanism here. Uh, then we're going to actually set up the telnet session, username, password, you set up the commands that you're going to be running on the access list, IP access list, extended host, um, no ACL, because when, when this script is running, when you try to say you, you want to implement uh, ACL 122, the count is at 122. If you try to log into the Cisco router access list and implement or, or put a 122 and 122 is already there, you're going to get an error. So the only thing we do here is we, we know that uh, no access list 122, take it out, make sure it's out before I actually put it in on that same uh, priority. Uh, the session information, also notable here is session one. So at any given time, real simply, you can take this script and add a second session to another device, a third session to a different device, so you could be running access list, multiple access lists. You can specify different names, uh, access list numbers. Uh, so you know, here's session one. You could also have session two, session three, session four, all within the same script. And then once I issue the commands, then I just the ACL count. I do the plus plus in Perl. It just increments in, increments it by one, and then I write that back to my ACL count file. So there's another file on the system that actually all it does is hold the number. Of the, um, of the ACL rotation. So we're gonna open the activity file. I do an activity, I like a lot of validation. I like, the, I like my scripts to tell me what's going on. So I have an activity file on the R syslog server that has every event that the script actually accomplishes. Uh, and then also, if I'm running the script at the command line, remember this is all automated, so uh, I'm not doing anything at the command line most of the time. But if I want to, if, if, you're, if you're sitting there working the script, developing it for your environment, you put the, uh, you, you print back to standard out so you can actually see what's going on in the script. Okay, uh, all right, so now we're gonna get into email configuration. This is just typical Perl email S SMTP uh, setup. So you, you define who you're sending it to. I'm sending the emails to me. You, you specify what the message is gonna be. You specify where to actually connect to your smart host or whatever you're sending it to, and you actually execute the email and send it off. So this is an actual email example. This is a real world what I get. So I get an email, the subject line is, hey, we just applied 242, deny IP, we denied this, this range or this IP address and it's been applied. The message body is, is uh, pretty much the same. It has a, a, a timestamp on it as well. Uh, just for validation, it tells me the new ACL has been applied, Telnet sessions closed, and ACL count incremented. If this was applied in error, click this link. This is the CGI. I have another script on the, on the server. This is why I run the web server with CGI. So I can actually click this link, and auto, automagically the script 
the delete script will just log back into the Cisco routers and pull that ACL out. So you're asking, well, why would you want to pull out a, a, an ACL that just uh, got, uh, uh, got applied? So in a real world scenario, you have a, a user phone, single user office or something, they're the home office. They're out there and they're on Time Warner, Time Warner cable modem and they lost power, the cable modem came up and uh, now they have a different IP address. Okay, remember in SIP.com for that specific user, I have uh, ACLs applied. So I specifically tell, I tell the system that that IP address is allowed to register with my system. If his home IP address changes, then it's going to automatically, the, the, um, the setup here is going to automatically block them. So at that point, I would get the emails and I would log into the Astra server into that SIP user and say, okay, this IP address, their new IP address is now authorized. And then I just uh, go back to the email, click this link, and it automatically pulls the, the ACLs out of the router without having to log in. It's just a, just a little extra step, a little extra script to, to help uh, automate things. And the delete script is uh, pretty much the same as the uh, apply script. Um, but we're just no, uh, we're just sending the no ACL and, and writing the activity to the file, um, printing back the standard out if needed, and sending another email. So basically one attempt, I get four emails, or uh, three emails, if I delete it, I also get a fourth email. So the ACL number, is ju it's just a number in a file, a specific range, it just carries, not all three of these would not be in a file, it's just an example. So I would only have one of these numbers in the file at any given time. ACL changes. This is just a file that stores all my events. So at any given time, if I wanted to look at what's been going on the last month, maybe I took vacation or I, I get the email. So I, I see what's happening in real time. But if I want a historical record, delete the emails and I can always go back to this file and see what's going on. So here's a real world example of a Cisco ACL. It's within my block range. I just took a snapshot of, of, uh, of what's going on. I blocked the whole class C's, uh, just personal preference. So what we see here is a good example, this guy and this guy. This was an intelligent scanner. So not just a regular SIP vicious or something like that. What it does is uh, if it does not get, so, so it'll be sitting there scanning my network, right? And as soon as it does not receive a reply, it knows it's been, ha or, uh, been blocked or something, it's going to stop scanning. It's not going to waste any more resources. It's going to move on to another IP and start scanning there. This guy right here it was probably a, a, a less sophisticated scanner. So even though he's blocked, he's still scanning my network just because my IP address was loaded in, his, in the scan utility. And it's, it's trying to scan 100,000 registration attempts. He's blocked but he's still gonna scan even though he's not getting any replies. So just a review, you have users, valid users registered into your system, a hacker attempt comes in, all the hosted PBX services throw their logs up to a central repository where fail to ban is running, constantly scanning logs every second and within a second or two, within a uh, max I've ever had is about two seconds. Uh, before the ACL is actually applied and stops the hacker at the gate. Um, I'll keep that slide up. That's about it. I'll take any questions now. Yes. Off-net users are uh, from time to time it happens, but very seldom. Yeah, I, I could do to, uh, you know, 200, 300, I could do as many as one as personal preference. Really, I, I only cycle through, I, I get so few attempts, actual attempts that get blocked that um, from 100 to 300 range, uh, I don't cycle through that for about six or eight months. I used to get a lot more attempts, but uh, since I implemented this, and uh, the, the, the real key is on the access list, I, I only allow people who are authorized to get to my network. So it really cuts down, that's the majority of what cuts down. But even if somebody's on 
say I allowed a network for uh, Time Warner Cable, uh, I have a specific user in that net block, there may be another comp compromised machine in that same class C and I get attacked. And so I'll block that and you know, that, that happens uh, uh, not too often, but it does. Next question. No, I block everybody implicitly. I don't allow just uh, unfettered access to my systems. You have to be one of my users, and I have to know where you're coming from uh, before I allow you IP access into my network. But what if somebody does want to let people from anywhere in the US? Then you're going to get a lot of hits. Yeah. It's just going to, it's just, you know, instead of running through uh, 100 to 200 every eight months, you're going to run through that every, uh, you know, six days. You'll just constantly be blocking people if you have open access, which, I mean, it'll work. It'll still work as implemented in this uh, configuration. You're just going to get a lot of attempts and a lot of blocking going on. Yeah, I, I don't remove the blocks uh, unless they're, uh, un yeah, I just let them cycle through. They override each other, so, you know. Yeah, I, it, uh, if they keep their cable modem powered on and there's no issues, they're uh, pretty much the, the ISPs nowadays that uh, they bind, they, they like to bind the, the IP address to the MAC address of the device. And if it's a short power hit, it'll usually come back with the same IP address. If they're having a network issue where uh, you know a whole class C goes offline or a whole neighborhood goes offline, like a like a major power outage in in the neighborhood. All the devices come up, and then it's anybody's you know, first come, first serve on IPs. Those IP addresses change. Uh, it's not really a big issue because it'll only happen. I don't have a whole lot of remote users, so it, it does happen, and it's just a maintenance event for me to or for them to call in and say, hey, my, my phone's not registered. Uh, but, but what I see more often than not is when a user's IP address changes, a remote user, I'll get an email from fail to ban that they just got blocked. So I'll jump into the system uh, and click the delete button, uh, you know, go into sip.conf and make sure they're allowed on that new IP address. And we usually do this in the morning time. So before the user gets up and has their coffee and starts to work, we've already cleared the air and the phone's already registered. I don't get a whole lot of calls that I don't know about that say, hey, you know, my phone's not registered. Can you unblock my IP? And it's also, uh, uh, we have very good relationship with our customers, so the customers, look, the off-net customers, they know what's going on here. You know, I tell them, I gotta specifically allow you. So if a user, I have users that call, that call in and say, hey, I'm gonna be, I'm taking my phone to someplace else, this is the IP address, can you go ahead and allow it? And they'll, they'll call me ahead of time when they know they're gonna be on a different IP that's specifically allowed. JR, I think it's worth mentioning, because in the sense of those questions there, um, you are kind of an obsessional blocker. You block everything, and there's no expire. But fail to ban actually explicitly has a really good uh, expiration thing, and you can set yep. that to whatever you want. So yes. my suggestion to people would be, and I'm asking for your uh, uh, condescension on this as well, but the way, I think the answer to that is if you want to open your network a little bit, the first question about blocking countries, if you know you don't have users in China, you go ahead and block China. Uh, if you've got people on like mobile phones, you're never gonna know their IPs ever. You don't even know what network they're on half the time. So in, Good case, point. So in cases like that, you open it up a little bit, you play around with your expiration time, which by default is 10 minutes, I think. Yeah. Uh, in my case, I'm totally opposite uh, of, of his scenario. So what I do is I get an email every day saying what fail to ban is doing. And what, what I see every once in a while, maybe once a week, is uh, somebody's trying to get in, trying to get in, and fail to ban takes about two seconds to cut them off. And then that's the end of it because nobody's gonna wait once, oh, let's see, it's uh, 59, okay, I can start to try to hack again. So they're blocked for like an hour or whatever time you want. So in the case of your mobile user, 
if you're asleep, JR, and somebody's calling you, you know, they're going to have to wait until you wake up, unless you've got Usually, them. yeah. <laughs> so uh, your comment on that, you agree, though, that you can, you can open it up but not be totally open to attack still. Sure. It's, it's, it's ultimately configurable for your operating environment. This is not going to work for everybody. I'm, a, I'm in a very specific uh, business, a uh, very specific customer base. This works extremely well for me. But the tools are there. They're just tools. They're, the scripts, you can modify them however you like. Fail to ban, uh, you can configure it with different filters and different ban times on off uh, to execute different things. Uh, it's just a toolbox. It's just uh, tools in the toolbox to you know, make it work how, how you need it to make it work. You could even have it send mean notes by, to the email of the administrator of the network that's uh, trying to attack you, if you sure, want. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so, so why do you block slash 24s instead of doing a DNS lookup on the owner of the IP in his block and just block? Sure, the, so uh, fail to ban, in the, in the fail to ban actually does a who is on the IP. So in the, in the, in the fail to ban email, uh, I not, get... No, who, not just who is, who? you can actually get um, those records through DNS and it's a lot faster and a lot easier to parse. Well, sure. It's configurable. It's configurable what information comes in the emails that fail to ban supplies. So back in the day, a few years ago, I used to be pretty adamant. I used to get you know, pretty upset with people trying to hack my network. So I was, uh, had, uh, I, I was always trying to contact the ISP that they were on and you know, telling those guys, hey, get, you're hacking my network. Stop that user, block that, block that IP address, and, and you know, they were like, yeah, sure, we'll get to it. <laughs> so it, at some point, you have to realize that people just don't care. You know, I mean, look at, look at Amazon. You can spin up an Amazon server for pennies and start hacking the world, and Amazon just doesn't care. You know, so it's, it, it's not incumbent upon the ISP where the compromised PC is. Oh, it, technically, it is their responsibility as, as an internet service provider, uh, it, it's, it, it's incumbent upon them to uh, prevent abuse coming out from their network, but in the real world, it, they really don't care. They got better things to do. So it, I take it personally to uh, uh, take care of it on my end. I think it's fair to say that anyone in this room, if we got something saying, hey, your network's screwed, somebody's screwing with, with us via your network, we'd look into it, but that in general, what JR just said, the world really doesn't give a crap. Yeah. Actually, uh, right on that point, I was wondering if there's uh, been any kind of uh, work on something like a community blacklist or something like that that yeah. would be more of a central repository because, uh, you know, a lot of these guys, <laughs> everybody's logs pretty much looks the same. Uh, sure. If you analyze them over a month's period, right, you'd be able to see the, the patterns and things like that. Has anyone ever started talking about that? Or yeah, Project Honeypot. Uh, worked with those guys a couple of years ago. The, pro the project really never took off. It was it was good ideas, but ultimately it's your responsibility to pull IP addresses in a central database. That hey, these are known hackers. They're not really known hackers. It's a botnet. It's a compromised Windows PC, something of that nature. It's not somebody specifically doing it. These are automated uh, mechanisms that go out and they infiltrate people's computers. And you, you just get to a point where, you know, I, do I want to spend this much time and effort trying to you know, build the community and build this, uh, this honeypot PBX and, and collect all these logs for what purpose? You got to ship those logs out to valid people that want them and that are going to do something with them. But, you know, typically it's, it's incumbent upon you to take care of your own. The project just never, never took off. There, there was good effort though. It was great effort, really smart people that wanted to do it, and but it just didn't take off. There's actually a uh, similar project, but unfortunately Windows based called uh, PeerBlock. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone's worked with it. I actually have Windows PBXs that I ended up using that to secure my networks from remote attacks because at the firewall level, I couldn't push the policies fast enough to prevent the PBX from being compromised. <clears throat> Pardon. So with the PeerBlock, lists, they just come in text limited files. So if anyone is looking for a list of, hey, here's China's IP, here's Eastern Europe, here's wherever, um, those lists are maintained by PeerBlock members and you can submit back to that and you can also pull from it and they're just CSV files. Yeah, so there, there's, a, there's a good project to look into. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? We're a little over. Probably a little over, over but, but it's this, lunch is, session, this is a so. great, this is a great uh, topic. This will be the last question, I guess. So um, 
you had a slide with tons of different IP addresses. Um, like, I assume that that's what happens when you get hit with a botnet. Yeah. They're just going to, you block an IP, they're going to go to the next one. Sure. Um, instead of blocking, have, is there a way to just maybe still respond? But Send them the wait. ping of death. No, no, just, just blow just, up their just terminal. Wait a second. Just, just wait a second, like a tar pit where you don't block them because then they know they're done. Just slow them down, throttle it. I, I guess you could, but I, I, I don't see why you would want to do that. If, if you're trying to compromise network, my network, I'm not just going to entertain it. I'm going to stop it and go do something else. It's, it's, not, it's, it's really trivial. Uh, these attacks come from all over the place. They're constant, constant attacks. It's, uh, it's not something that I'm really, you know, spend, spend a lot of time and a lot of cycles worrying about and pouring over and trying to mitigate this. I mean, I've been running this system now for years and years and years. And it just it just sits there and works, and I you know I sleep at night, so it's not it's not you know I, I do I go do other things and worry about hackers. Okay, I think it's about time for an excellent box lunch. <laughs> Thank you, Jr. Jr. Richardson, great presentation. <laughs>